The biggest island of the Greater Antilles is Cuba, which is often called the Gem of the Caribbean Sea and the Key of the New World. During Spanish colonization, Cuba was the junction of shipping routes. The country consists of 1,250 kilometers long, narrow, greater island and 1,600 various sized ones, the majority of which are formed by corals. Cuba is a colorful country where the colonial old town of Havana harmonizes with the oil wells, the sandy beaches and crystalline water of Varadero, the seemingly endless sugarcane plantations in the hills, the country towns keeping the ruins of their former elegance, luxurious hotels, old cars, the huge vultures present everywhere, the old fortresses, Che Guevara's monument, the cigar factories, and the small country farms. The rays of the tropical moonlight broke into pieces rocking on the waves. Here, in the middle of the Caribbean Sea, the breeze brings the sweet smell of blooming lemon trees and burnt sugar. A quick sniff of the air was enough to know the islands are not far away. They're like green, twinkling, scattered emeralds in the sea, and you could feel on each of them that the other one will be more unspoiled and intact than the previous one. It's an ideal home for Robinson Crusoe. Paul Monet starts his novel Havana with these lines. The atmosphere and the natural beauties of Cuba have also inspired others to write poetic lines. It's enough to think of the revolutionary poet José Martí and, of course, Hemingway, whose spirit follows the traveler all the way wherever he goes in the country. A long, narrow peninsula reaches into the sea 140 kilometers from Havana and 20 kilometers from Matanzas, and it separates the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. It's Varadero, the world-famous resort of the islands, which was a popular destination of vacationers and foreign tourists even between the two world wars. In the 1950s, American businessmen invested here, having hotels and casinos built in this way. A hundred thousand Americans arrived here to relax and soak up the sun. Life was great. Champagne and rum flowed. Cigar smoke was abundant. Caribbean music with its spinning rhythm wafted over the beach and on stage. Cuban girls danced in bikinis decorated with feathers. Millionaires had their luxurious villas built here. Then, politics intervened, there was a revolution, and the relationship between Cuba and America is strained yet today as a result. Hotels and villas were taken over by the state. In the meantime, Varadero has again become the most popular tourist destination in the world, but especially for Europeans. Next to the old ones, new four- and five-star luxurious hotels meeting everybody's requirements have been built. The majority of them belong to the former Spanish colonists, on the snow-white sandy beach, dignified royal palm trees nod. The water is crystalline, turquoise, and incredible shades of blues and green. Shops sell Cuban cigars even today, and at the bars of the hotels, skillful bartenders mix daiquiris, mojitos, and the Cuban libre. The peninsula is closed by a barrier. Here, only taxis or hired cars can enter, so tourists can have their holiday without being disturbed. The breeze blowing from the sea moderates the tropical heat. The hotel rooms are, of course, air-conditioned. Restaurants offer specialties of the Caribbean region and international dishes as well. It's especially worth trying the roasted dishes and the aromatic fruit. And there are cocktails made without alcohol, too. Cuba gives tourists from former East Bloc countries a chance to re-encounter their past, as if they were taking a trip back in time. At the markets, we can buy mainly wood carvings and pottery as souvenirs, but cigar boxes equipped with a vapor meter, original machetes, maps drawn on leather, and paintings in bamboo frames can also be had. In the street, we can see small two-seat motorbikes with yellow cabins, which almost look like the tuk-tuk of Thailand, but there are also carts which function as taxis here. In the city, you can take one of the open, sightseeing double-deckers. In the city center, we can also see some of the old wooden villas. Among the simple, small bungalows, there are some colonial palaces and luxurious villas which have been converted into restaurants.
a sort of American traveling monument of the 1950s, are old-timers. And although the most can be seen in Havana, they also add color to the panorama of the city of Varadero. Don't be surprised if somebody starts the engine of his car with a crank. The ignition key may have been taken away by the American owner of the car 40 years ago. The markets are full of scale models of these cars, made of wood, ceramics, or paper, but of course we can also find small barrels of rum and musical instruments. This peninsula is the closest to the coast of Florida, so it has been the scene of bitter attempts to emigrate several times when Cubans tried to reach the land of unlimited opportunities in small aquatic vehicles making their fleeing an impossible dream. Luxurious hotels not only provide their guests with a comfortable place to rest their weary heads, but also three meals a day, including drinks and ice cream. The service is extraordinarily polite and helpful. We can lounge in the tropical park next to the pool, listen to the palm trees rustling, sip something cool at the pool bar, lavish in the jacuzzi, and if we're bored with all this, we can try out the wide range of sports. Group activity organizers encourage vacationers to try their hand at archery, play water polo, or beach volleyball. Of course, there's a wide range of water sports as well. At many hotels, we can use canoes, surfboards, or catamarans without extra charge, and we can participate in diving courses too. To entertain guests, there are new programs every day. By day, the audience is dazzled with water ballet performances, at night with Caribbean shows, beauty contests, or costume balls.
Santa Clara, the seat of the Villa Clara region, owes its existence to the fact that the coastal city of San Juan de los Remedios suffered a lot from pirates. The pirates' attacks caused a majority of the population to look for a safer place further inland. Santa Clara, surrounded by hills, came into existence in 1689 and soon became the center of the region due to its location. The main square, Parque Vidal, was named after the colonel who died during the Second War of Independence here. The square looks like any other square in Cuba. It has beautiful parks and is decorated by peacock flowers, boxwood, and royal palms with a classical bandstand in the middle. The houses flanking the square were built in the 1920s and are mainly buildings with pillars and arcades. One of them is the best cafe in the city. The neoclassical building of Palacio Provincial is decorated by ionic columns and big tympanum. The building houses offices and a library and we can find a cinema, bank and several hotels on the square. The biggest building is the renovated Teatro La Caridad. Its tympanum on the facade has a slashed shape rather than the common triangular one. If it hadn't been for Che Guevara, today Santa Clara might only have its main square to be proud of. In this way, however, we can't miss the Square of Revolution and the mausoleum which houses the remains of Che Guevara and 16 of his fellow combatants killed in 1967 during the Bolivia campaign. In the huge Plaza de la Revolución, the monumental statue of the hot-tempered but ardent commander can be seen from far away. The relief of the pedestal depicts the episodes of Che's life. Across the square, a museum commemorates his life of 39 years. In 1998, Pope John Paul II held Mass here with a crowd of worshippers. Live fast, dangerously, and die early. This may be the watchword of every true revolutionary, but Ernesto Che Guevara lived it. He was born in 1928 in Argentina and was executed in 1967 in Bolivia. Today, he lives on as a legend. Sancti Spiritus, i.e. Saint Souls, is one of the oldest cities of Cuba. Spanish Governor Diego Velazquez ordered to have it founded in 1514. In the main square, flanked with colonial-style houses, the schools of the city can be found. While in the junior section of elementary school, the pupils wear a blue tie, and in the senior section they wear a red tie, the students at secondary schools have a uniform consisting of a yellow skirt or trousers with a white shirt or blouse. There are nice dashes of color in the streets of Cuba. In the middle of the square, decorated with palm trees, a bandstand and the statue of the strategist who was killed in action, General Serafin Sanchez, can be found. He isn't alone, sharing his solitude with the stone statue of José Martí. The venerable hotel of the city is the Perla de Cuba. Because its rooms have a high ceiling, the roof of the building is at the same level as the tower of the church. The building of the theater, decorated with columns and balconies, is an important element of the city. The main square is the center of social life where friends come together to have a chat. As everywhere in the Torrid Zone, the people here like living their lives in the streets. In the side streets opening from the square, the Presbyterian Church and the Big Parish Church can be found. The Museum of Colonial Arts lies on the road leading to the River Yayabo. The unadulterated atmosphere of bygone times fills the cobblestone streets and squares surrounded by arched palaces. 
We can see archaic balconies and ornate barriers, gates hammered with nails, behind the gates inner yards with flowers, ceilings covered with wood, windows with bars. This is Trinidad, the timeless city, the place everybody must see. Local people said these sentences until, in the end, UNESCO took it on trust, and in 1988, the city of former sugar barons was pronounced a part of the world heritage. It was the third settlement that Valaquez had founded in the land of Cuba. The fertile plain lying between the Escambray Mountains and the sea was favorable for growing sugarcane. Local sugar barons, the Brunette and the Iznaga family, had lavish palaces built for themselves from the revenue from sugarcane. At the same time, colonial townhouses were built around the palaces. The boom of the 17th to the 19th century was broken by the First War of Independence. The plantations were spoiled, and the nearly 50 sugar refineries of the neighborhood were destroyed. The bright palaces became uninhabited. The city was inflicted by poverty and decay. During the time between the two world wars, it was the first time people had tried to revive Trinidad. After the victory of the revolution, museums were set up in the renovated palaces. The half a century that has passed since then has been a continuous fight against missing out on something. Trinidad could be the true jewel box of Cuba if there were more money spent on the renovation and maintenance of buildings. The center of the old town is Plaza Mayor, rising like a staircase and embellished with royal palms. On the north side, the Neo-Baroque Holy Trinity Church stands. Next to it, the Palace of the Brunette Counts, which is now a museum. The houses flanking the square from a united architectural group, their harmony unbroken by any other modern buildings. We could say the whole city is a museum. There are museums of architecture, archaeology, and an exhibition of natural science established by the famous scientist Alexander von Humboldt. The remains of the Baroque tower and cloister of the former St. Francis Monastery belong to the school today. The other tower, Torre Isnaga, dates back to 1766. The Museo Romantico tells us about the life of sugar barons as the Cantero Palace in the nearby Simon Bolivar Street. In Attila Borghidi's words, Taste, elegance, and luxury describe this beautiful building with a shady patio and a small garden with palms. Downstairs, there's a kitchen, a shed, and the former servants' flats. Upstairs, a nine-room suite for the counts. The huge carved double doors, windows, and Venetian blinds, the wainscoting and boarded ceiling of some rooms were made of mahogany. The hand-painted fresh ornaments on the walls, which consist of tropical fruit, leaf, and flower motifs, are fascinating. The rooms were furnished with brilliant Baroque sets of furniture. What else could we add to this? As if we were on the set of a South American soap opera. The open kitchen and its well-preserved furnishings take us back to the past, aided by the exhibited drawings, maps, engravings, and photos. From the tower, we can see the new tourist center of Trinidad, which was built on a high hill. Near the motel, the entrance to the stalagmite cave, Cueva Maravillosa, can be found. Cienfuegos is often referred to as the Pearl of the South, the name doesn't come from the people living here, but from travelers. This is surely one of the most beautiful and lively cities of Cuba. The city built on the coast of the 25-kilometer-long bay was founded by French refugees from Louisiana. The 
ornate Baroque Palace of Culture has been adorned by a dome, added later and reachable by a spiral staircase. From here, there's a good view of the square and the houses of the neighboring streets. The main square, flanked by monument-like houses with arcades, lives up to the beauty of the rest of the city. Its bandstand dates back to 1922. Its statue depicts the ideologist of the revolution, the poet José Martí. The author of Guantanamera was born in 1853, traveled around Europe, and then settled down in New York, where he worked as a journalist. In 1895, he started the Second War of Independence of Cuba and was killed in action during this war. He was buried in Santiago de Cuba. The building of the university has one floor, richly embellished with frescoes. The building with columns and timpana resembles a theater, but in reality, it's a dormitory. In the square, we can find the neoclassical cathedral, only one tower of which was finished, the other one just a fragment. Opposite its facade, bronze lions are on the lookout. Since it is of French origin, the principles of the layout of San Fuegos differ from the accustomed. Its network of streets, which is like a checkerboard and marked with numbers, is clear-cut. From the main square, a pedestrian district, Chopping Street, lead us to the Prado. Under the arcades of the wide avenue, there are ice cream cellars, cafes, and restaurants one after another. San Fuegos is also well known for its legends. Huaga, after whom the bay was named, is the Cuban version of the ancestral mother Eve. Guama was named after an Indian chief who led a rebellion against Spanish rule. We can approach the island across the channel of the Salt Lake by ship or boat. On the island, an artificially formed Indian village with huts with palm roofs and statues depicting Indians awaits us. The statues present Taino Indians during their everyday activities, mainly fishing and hunting. The Spanish thought the Indians had sunk their treasures here and slaughtered them for this reason. The conquerors didn't find gold. Tourists can't find Indians. Although some young Cubans dress up like Indians for the tourists' sake so that they will have somebody to take a photo with. There are plenty of snack bars on the island and accommodation in the palm huts built on pails. The flora and fauna are interesting. Crocodiles don't live in the wild anymore, but fishermen can find several kinds of fish, and we can see unusual birds, too. If we're lucky and keep our eyes open, we can even spot a hummingbird, the smallest bird in the world, which only lives here. Indians used to hunt creeping rats and peccaries with their trained dogs. A peccary is a kind of small boar, and there are a lot of them living on the island even today, but they also liked eating crocodile meat. The waters are full of fish, and there are 300 species of birds, 54 of which are native. The water lilies floating on the surface of the water are beautiful, and we can also find extraordinary bird nests. Five to six meter long crocodiles with diamond-shaped noses used to inhabit the Laguna del Tesoro and the bogs of Zapata. This large population was turned into boots and handbags by hunters, so the remaining ones had to be protected. As a result, crocodile farms were established, accommodating other species as well. The reptiles were packed in one of the enclosed bays of Lake Tesoro, apparently having no difficulty in breathing in captivity. Today, over 10,000 crocodiles live here. We can observe them from above, 
but we can even hold the babies in our hands. The region is important also from the aspect of history. The nearby Playa Giron was the site of the famous American landing in 1961. 1,400 armed soldiers landed, hoping to overthrow Castro's regime. 300 of them died, 1,100 fell into captivity. Along the road, we can count 85 places commemorating those who lost their lives. A museum commemorates the intervention, but aside from this, Playa Larga and Playa Giron are nothing more than resorts with sandy coast and shallow water. Hemingway's name is connected to Cuba just as much as that of Columbus or Che Guevara. The Nobel Prize winning American writer lived in Cuba for 20 years, from 1939 with short breaks. He first visited this place in 1928, and on each occasion he stayed in room 511 at Mundo's Hotel in the old town of Havana. Mi mojito en la bodeguita, mi daquiri en la floredita, he said, making the two bars known all over the world. After the Spanish Civil War, in 1939, he rented Villa Finca Villa in the region called San Francesco de Paola in the region of Havana. He lived here with his third wife, the journalist Martha Gellhorn. Hemingway adored masculine, challenging sports, boxing, bullfight, hunting, and fishing all his life. The main building of Finca Villa belonged to the writer. The tower next to it was his wife's. In the house, the posters of bullfights remind us of Death in the Afternoon and The Dangerous Summer. The trophies and weapons are reminiscent of The Green Hills of Africa, Christmas at the Top of the World, and The Snows of Kilimanjaro. The photos on the walls show the author in khaki, just like experiences in For Whom the Bell Tolls and A Farewell to Arms. On the bookshelves, there are small objects, gifts from friends and fans. The dining room is set. There are drinks on the tea trolley, just as their owner left them here. When he went away, he left his villa, 6,000 volume library, and his personal belongings to the Cuban people. He knew he would never return. He shot himself in the head with his shotgun at his home in Idaho in 1961. His death, as well as his life and art, occupies the world even today. Did he think he had an incurable disease? Was he having a crisis in his private life or a kind of writer's block? Did he escape from aging and the diseases accompanying it? In all probability, all these reasons could have sent him spinning into a deeper and deeper depression. On the desk, typewriter, books, and manuscripts. Among the photographs in the tower of Finca Villa are pictures of the writer in his childhood, as well as Spencer Tracy in the leading role of the old man in the sea. The source of the story is the life of the very old fisherman, Fuentes, who died at the age of 105. And here is the famous photo, Hemingway gives a cup to the winner of a fishing contest, Fidel Castro. The villa is huge, in its shady park a sad view of a ship in dry dock. On the deck of the Pilar, which witnessed the many adventures of its owner, the writer fished for marlin, the huge dolphin-sized swordfish. He even hunted for Nazi submarines in the Caribbean Sea. In the garden, there's a swimming pool. Next to it, four small graves can be found. The writer's beloved hunting dogs. 
the objects for which there was no room in the house have been placed in the tower. From there, there's a fantastic view of Havana. We can see the huge green area surrounding the city and the skyscrapers of the new quarters, as well as the building of the Hotel Nacional. You can even spot the dome of the capital. Hemingway kept his ship in the Bay of Kohimar nearby, and his favorite restaurant, La Terraza, where he especially liked the fish dishes, can also be found here. The specialty called Big Hemingway Platter contains four ounces of lobster, almost nine ounces of giant shrimp, and four ounces fish filet with dill sauce and tomatoes. Anybody can try it at the writer's former hangout. Hemingway was awarded the Nobel Prize for his novel titled The Old Man in the Sea. In this novel, he was able to use his past experiences, but it wasn't he who served as model for the main character, but an old fisherman called Gregorio Fuentes, who lived in Cojimar but was born on the Canary Islands and moved to Cuba in his childhood. Havana, the Caribbean Babylon, didn't get its name by chance. Altogether, two million Spanish, Indian, African, Chinese, mulatto, and other peoples live here together in peace. The Metro bus, a long bus pulled by a semi-trailer, holds 200 people at a time, transporting them throughout the city, which spans 45 kilometers. It's the biggest settlement in Central America. Fortunately, the tourist sites are limited to a smaller territory than this in the Viejo Habana, Centro Habana, and Vedado city regions. Sought by everyone, relics of the colonial past can be found in the old town Viega. Outside the former city wall, in the middle of a monumental park, the building of the Capitolio can be found. This huge palace with a white dome is the symbol of the American influence. It was built in 1929 taking the capital in Washington as a model. Due to its designer's healthy Cuban self-confidence, it was built to be one meter higher than the original. It served as the parliament of the Cuban Republic for three decades. In one of its wings, the House of Representatives, in the other wing, the Senate was in session. After the victory of the revolution, a new function was given it, and today it is the seat of the Cuban Scientific Academy. Because there is a lot of room left in it, the Museum of Natural Science and the Planetarium were also set up here. The 208-meter-wide facade looks onto Marti Esplanade, which is always busy and broadens to become a square. Next to the capital, an impressively beautiful building can be seen. This neoclassical palace, ornamented with statues, columns, and small towers, is the National Theater, which was named after the anti-fascist poet Federico Garcia Lorca. As a result of his beliefs, General Franco had him executed. Exploring the real beauties of a city can be done best on foot, but sightseeing can also be continued by hailing a cab. In the street opening opposite, we can find El Floridita, which is a bar and a restaurant in one and is one of the most popular in Havana. In the corner of the bar, Hemingway leans against the counter, as he used to do when yearning for a swig of daiquiri. This cocktail was first given to workers as a refreshment in the mine the bar was named after. It is made in many ways, but its base is Cuban white rum, lemon juice, and lots of ice. Sugar syrup, triple sec, or maraschino can also be added, but it can be made with banana or orange as well. And it's best to drink it right here on the spot. The determining elements of the panorama of Havana are the American old-timers. In the 1950s, Americans not only bought real estate here, but they also brought their cars, which were the most modern at that time. After the revolution, Fidel nationalized the cars too. They belong to the national heritage. They're not for sale even if the collector had paid huge amounts for a chromed Oldsmobile or a pink Cadillac, a winged Chevrolet, or a Studebaker. 
In Cuba, there are no places where they dissemble old cars. The wrecks can still be driven. As spare parts are not available for these models at all, it's a challenge to maintain them. Perhaps there's little money, but there's always an idea. Cigars are a source of public enjoyment in Cuba. The natives of the island, Taino American Indians, also smoked rolled up tobacco leaves. The climate is very suitable for growing tobacco here. Tobacco of the best quality grows near Pinar del Rio. The buds and flowers of tobacco are cut so that the leaves can get more nutrition and grow bigger. Its harvest is done only by hand and with great know-how, exactly 80 days after planting. The body of the cigar is made from the upper leaves of the plant, the covering leaves are taken from the middle part of the plant, and the low part is suitable only to hold the cigar together. In barns built only for this purpose, the leaves are aired for two months. The leaves that have turned from green to brown are collected in 20 bunch bundles and they're fermented twice. After ripening, wetting and selecting, they're rolled. Handwork and long courses of work are the reasons for the high price of cigars. Cigar production used to be a royal monopoly. Today, it is a state monopoly. In the 19th century, there were nearly 10,000 plantations and over 1,000 cigar factories around the capital. In the 20th century, only 120 factories were in operation and now six factories make hand-rolled cigars of the best quality. In the capital behind Capitolio Partagas is the best known building where there is also a museum. And we can find an uncountable number of cigar shops all over Cuba. Let's remember when we buy cigars, they should be stored in a humidor equipped with a hydrometer, otherwise they dry out and spoil. We should keep the receipts of the cigars bought because we can expect the customs officer's inquiry upon departure from the country. Havana is abundant with beautiful wide streets flanked with shady avenues such as Azulueta, Las Misiones, Fifth Avenue, and the famous Prado. The most beautiful palaces and villas were built along such streets, and even if not all have been remodeled, they're jewels of the city, even with crumbling plaster. A traveler recounted the following in 1861. In Havana, the downtown houses have got floors, they're mainly built in Moorish style with spacious, heavy arcs and covered corridors on vaults around the yard. Not a single house has an attic. The roof is covered with stone panels and is flat. Underclothes are usually hung out on the roof to dry, and sometimes the people go walking up there in the evenings. The ceilings of the rooms are indeed high. In the old days, servants used to fan the air manually. Later, electric fans were used to cool the air. The roof covered with stone tiles provides some protection from the heat as do the water spray of the fountains and the plants in the patios, the inner courtyards. In the simple one-floor building standing on the corner of Calle Picotam, the poet José Martí was born in the winter of 1853. He later died a hero's death. Today, the house is a museum packed with Martí's books, manuscripts, and keepsakes. Hotel Nacional was built in 1933 during the stay of the Americans and its construction was mainly financed by the Mafia's money. In contemporary newsreels, dictator Batista, the American ambassador Mr. Wells, and some rather shady-looking rough-and-tough guys can be seen taking part in the opening ceremony. Built in the colonial style, the two-tower building has seven stories with 416 rooms, and though it belongs to the state, it still meets the luxurious needs of rich guests, just like its neighbor, the 30-story, five-star hotel Habana Libre. 
The park of the Hotel Nacional faces the bay and the fortresses, and in the evening we can watch an original Caribbean show. The streets and squares in the city center with their inimitable atmosphere are the real soul to any sightseeing tour in Havana. We can find something interesting everywhere. The tree standing in the garden of the old ruinous church has a luck-bringing feature. You should circle the tree three times and each time throw a coin to the bottom of the tree while making three wishes. One of the wishes of tourists may be to return to Havana. The ashes of the great discoverer Columbus were taken to the Cathedral of Havana in 1795, where he remained in peace for a century until the Spanish took the ashes to Sevilla after the Americans marched in. Despite this, the cemetery in Havana is still called Cologne. The construction of the cathedral named after St. Christopher was begun by Jesuit monks, but it was consecrated only in 1777. The interesting feature of the three-aisle church reflecting features of the Italian Baroque is the two towers which are different from each other. Next to the cathedral, Hotel Ambos Mundos and La Bodeguita del Medio can be found. Both of them were made famous by Hemingway. La Bodeguita is not only the peak of the cocktails from rum, but the cuisine of Cuba and the Caribbean is at its best here as well. Among its guests are two Latin American writers, Pablo Neruda and Gabriel Garcia Marquez, as well as a lot of famous actors and actresses, like Errol Flynn, Jack Lemmon, Brigitte Bardot, Pierre Richard, and Gérard Depardieu. The restaurant was opened in 1942 and is famous for its funny custom of famous and not-so-famous guests writing their autographs on the walls, thus making painting impossible and unnecessary. We can also join the illustrious company. After a good dinner, we can ask the waiter for a pen and add our name to the illustrious collection, if we can find room. Music is in the blood of the Cubans. They've given the world such artists as the singer Gloria Estefan or Campai Segundo and the world-famous Buena Vista Social Club, consisting of old musicians. The famous market of Havana, behind the cathedral, is rather a kind of flea market as can be found in every capital. There are t-shirts with the portrait of Che Guevara, objects made of shells, and models of old-timers made of Coke cans. Besides cheaper, run-of-the-mill, mass-produced articles, we can also buy more imaginative and unique souvenirs. Among the countless paintings of various quality, you can sometimes find a real piece of art. The church El Templete was built on the site where the first mass was held by the Spanish who landed in 1517. Near the church we can find the Palace of Chief Captains, which used to be the residence of the Spanish captains of Cuba. All the houses in the square were formerly noble palaces, but are today public or office buildings. The fountain in the middle of the square is just as famous as a meeting place as Piccadilly in London. <laughs> Growing sugarcane started on the territory that belongs to India and China today, consequently spreading to other parts of Asia, then through Arabian mediation it spread into Egypt, Sicily and Spain. On the American continent, it was unknown before Columbus, reaching Cuba in the middle of the 16th century. It was first grown in the Valley of Sugar Mills. The Spanish government had black slaves brought from Africa, and these slaves were made to work in the fields by the sugar barons. The squeezed juice of sugarcane is a popular refreshment, mainly with children in all countries where it's grown. Seasoned with rum, adults also like drinking it. Sugar is made from the squeezed sugarcane juice by refining. Rum is made by fermenting sugarcane juice or by fermenting triacle left after processing sugar. The juice gained in this way is distilled, filtered, and bottled. 
Rum was made for the first time in the 17th century on the Caribbean islands, and the rum from Cuba, Jamaica, and Puerto Rico is still the most famous. White rum is made without aging. Gold rum is made by aging for a very short time. Dark, heavy, aromatic rum is ready to be drunk after aging it in oak barrels for five, seven, or ten years. Rum was the favorite drink of sailors for a long time. Let's remember Treasure Island, 15 men on a dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho, -ho, and a bottle of rum. Of course, not only sailors like it, many people add some to their tea, and it is, of course, an excellent ingredient for cocktails. At the Rum Museum in Havana, we can not only follow the history and manufacturing process of this beverage with the help of the tools, objects, and models displayed, but we can also taste the various types of rum. The admission fee does include taste testing, but if it is not enough, we can sit at the bar of the Havana Club and listening to Cuban music, we can enjoy an array of cocktails made with rum, such as piña colada, Cuba Libra, mojito, or zombie. Rum and drinks containing rum can be drunk not only cold with ice, but also hot in the form of grog or punch. The word for sugar comes from the old Sanskrit shakara, while the word for rum originates from saccharum, the Latin word for sugar. Fruit-flavored sugarcane distillate belongs to the liqueurs, and the Spanish name of these is batida. These can include coconut, pineapple, banana, or orange flavors. The capital abounds in beautiful old monuments like Carlos Manuel de Cespedes, the monument of General Maximo Gomez, the father of the land, or the monument of the Yak Grama. The outstanding sites of Havana are three fortresses, which used to protect the harbor and the city. The oldest one is El Castillo de la Fuerza Real, an appealing little fortress with four corner towers. The two bigger fortresses are across the bay, Bahia de la Habana, where a huge statue of Christ, reminding us of the one in Rio, also stands. Through the 735 meter long tunnel under the bay, we can reach Castillo de Moro, Construction on the fortress, rising 30 meters above sea level, began in 1598 to protect the bay from enemy ships. The lighthouse standing here was built later, in 1845. On the east part of the bay, the biggest fortress, which gives the most beautiful panorama over the city, can be found. Castillo de San Carlos de la Cabana stands on the hill from where the English started to shoot at the fortress of Moro. It was built towards the end of the 1700s, and it has been connected with Moro by a tunnel for a long time. Its plans were designed by French engineers, and it has impressive dimensions, 700 meters in length and 300 meters in width. Its construction cost the Spanish government a fortune, and this turned out to be in vain, because no battles were ever fought in the fortress. Nowadays, museums, exhibition rooms, and restaurants can be found there, but many people come here only because of the view.
One attraction based on tradition attracts unbelievable crowds of people every evening. At 9 p.m., when the harbor closed and people were told to go to bed, silencio, silence was shouted, and a gunshot was fired. Today, it doesn't hasten tourists to go to bed, but instead gives a sign to go out and enjoy the nightlife of Havana. And which place would be better for this purpose than the Tropicana Show, which has entertained its audience with a spectacular review for over 60 years. Thank you.